morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, the verse that we I, I want to read this morning is uh, Deuteronomy twenty four sixteen. Fathers shall not be put to death because of their children, nor shall children be put to death because of their fathers. Each one shall be put to death for his own sin. You shall not pervert justice due to the sojourner, uh, to, due to the sojourner, or to the fatherless, or take a widow's garment and pledge. But you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I command you to do this. May the Lord bless the reading of His Word. Uh, let's bow before the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, um, we thank you so much for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, we, uh, we know that we're living in some hard times, Lord, and uh, please be with us and help us to remember your word, and as we seek to understand your word and to seek to know you better and to seek the Lord Jesus Christ, help us to keep finding you in the word and keep finding, uh, keep finding Jesus Christ in our, in our time spent with you, in our prayer, in our thoughts in our reading of the word, and please open up your word to us this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. As uh, you, many of you know, I think everybody knows, uh, we just had a baby on Tuesday. That was pretty awesome. And uh, I just, I love her to death. Uh, she's, I love her as much as I love her other sisters, but I just love, I love her to death, and she's so cute. And uh, when we were in the hospital, uh, I was just admiring her, and you know, I was, she looks just like her, her sister Miriam. She's just the cutest little thing, straight black hair, and she was, she's actually her biggest child, eight pounds, 13 ounces. That's pretty awesome. And you know, being in the hospital room uh, with not a lot much to do but take care of a baby, um, sometimes you just want to turn on the TV and look at local news. Um, basically, uh, we decided to flip on the local news, it was uh, Fox News Network, and we heard that Antifa, or the anti-fascist movement, they, uh, they took over the city of, half the city of Seattle. They took over a local precinct, they drove out the police, they set up barricades, they have armed guards with guns, heavily armed guns, people who say that they don't believe in guns, by the way. People who say they don't believe in police uh, are policing this entire little precinct and making people obey their every command. And it's astounding how hateful these people are. They burn down businesses. They, 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 they blame white people and cops for all their problems. Even if they are white people, they, they blame them for their problems. And they have this idea that white people are all racist. When you are born and you are brought into this world, you apparently are a racist little person. And you need to repent and ask for forgiveness of your ancestors' crimes. This is called uh, many things. It's even infiltrated the church where we call critical, critical race theory where, why, where the, the oppressed people in, in the world need to be elevated to a status of leadership and the people who are not oppressed need to be lowered down to a status of sub subjectude and poverty. And, we, and they need to repent for all their crimes. The reason why I read Deuteronomy 24, 16, it's a, the scripture takes a strong stance against this. It says, Fathers shall not be put to death because of their children, nor shall children be put to death because of their fathers, each one shall be put to death for his own sin. Which means you did not inherit your ancestors' sins. It may affect you in some way. They, uh, you know, often, oftentimes uh, in my family, my grandfather was a very godly person in many ways, but he was also very angry, and he treated his children very angrily. And in turn, they treated their children very angrily. And so I inherited 
this anger because my parents treated me badly. So sin does affect people in future generations. But their guilt, I cannot repent for my grandfather's anger. But I can repent for my own anger. I can't repent for what these white people did back in the early 1600s, 1700s, and 1800s did. I can't repent for what their, their sin that they committed by enslaving people who were from Africa. I can't repent of that. I can only repent of my own sin. That is what the Scriptures say. Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor shall children be put to death for their fathers. Each one shall be put to death for his own sin. And that's what this idea of white privilege is all about. It's that you are racist because your ancestors were racist. I'll pick a little bit on my mom's uh, father. He was a very racist person as well. And he had a brother that was even more racist. And they were both staunch Democrats. But my grandfather uh, would not vote for a... Uh, my grandfather on my mom's side would not vote for a black person because he was just that racist. He did not vote for President Obama. But my, my, my uncle, he was, my great uncle, he was, he was so staunch Democrat that even though he was very racist, he, he didn't stop voting Democrat, but he just couldn't vote for President Obama. And that's a sin, and I'm going to call that a sin, being racist for that reason. I don't think Obama was a great president personally. But I can't say that I, could, I shouldn't have voted for him because of his skin color. Because the Bible says that there is no such thing as different biological races. We've all been born from one blood. From the blood of Adam and Eve. That is who we're all descended from. We're not descended from monkeys. We're not descended from pigs or baboons. So sometimes we act like baboons. We don't descend from those people. We descend from or those animals. We descend from Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve had children. They had, had children. They had children until Noah. And Noah, the whole human race kind of started over after him. And we have the account of the Genesis flood where God wiped away all of humanity and all of the animals in the flood except Noah and all that was aboard the ark. Which is a picture of Jesus Christ. That everyone who is in Jesus Christ, just like everyone was in the ark, are saved and have, have salvation from God's wrath. They do not have, we do not have to worry about God's wrath if we've repented and put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. But from Noah and his three sons and their wives descended all the rest of humanity. So we are all closely, more closely related than evolutionists would like us to think. And so genetically, there's no such thing as black people, there's no such thing as white people, there's no such thing as, as yellow or red people. It's actually, genetically, we have this thing called melanin in our, that determines what, uh, how, uh, it basically blocks UV rays from the, the sun. And it keeps you from being sunburned. People with less melanin look a little bit more pale. People with more melanin look a little bit darker. But what melanin does is it, it's just God's gift protecting you from the sun. And you shouldn't be more jealous or angry at a person with more melanin than you or with less melanin than you. You know, a lot of people think that they are good people down apart. In Matthew chapter 5, Verse 22, it says, You've heard it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. For whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, You fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then, excuse me, come offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court. Lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you shall not get out until you have paid the last penalty. In Matthew 5, Jesus is giving his Sermon on the Mount. He is preaching and teaching the disciples and the multitudes how to enter the kingdom of heaven. 
and, li and live in the kingdom of heaven. When Jesus sat down on the mountain and opened his mouth, he was giving solemn instruction and formally teaching the Old Testament. He told his hearers that they must be more righteous than the religious teachers of the day. And this is and his, thou shalt not be angry, or, or, thou shalt not murder, is one of his six part rebuke against the teaching and morality of the scribes and Pharisees. They thought they were better than everybody else. And that's what the Antifa people are like. They think they're better than everybody else. And so do a lot of white people. They think they're better than everybody else. But if you really go to the heart of it, you and I think that we're better than everybody else. We oftentimes seek after ourselves, seek after our own pleasures, our own wants, and our own desires. Sin is an every person problem. You know, some people say that Jesus was misusing the Old Testament here. Just like they would say, oh, you're misusing Deuteronomy 24, 16, because fathers shall not be put to death because of their children, shall not shall be put to death because of their fathers, each one shall be put to death for his own sin. They would say, you're using that to say that there's no such thing as white privilege when, God, when Moses would have never thought of white privilege. Well... I'm not trying to rip it out of Moses' context, and neither was Jesus using this scripture, pulling it out of its context and twisting it. Jesus was correctly interpreting the Old Testament and applying it to his, to his hearers. So when we read the Old Testament, we, we do want to understand context. But we also have to realize that the Bible is a document written for all times to all people, and, it's, and a lot of its principles carry over into today. In fact, this verse, Deuteronomy 24, 16, there was a king whose father was assassinated. And Israel made this guy king. And he put to death the assassins uh, who killed his father. But what he didn't do was kill the assassins' children. And if they quote this verse, fathers shall not be put to death because their children, nor shall children be put to death because their fathers. Each one shall be put to death for his own sin. Ezekiel. Over in Ezekiel 18, Ezekiel was addressing his hearers, and his hearers were, were basically saying, God isn't fair. He's judging us for our father's sin. And they would misquote Exodus 20, which says that basically God visits the iniquity to the third and the fourth generation. But what they don't didn't interpret right was that God visits iniquity, not the sin, God, the, the sin isn't per, isn't always performed by the children. Each one is accountable for his or her own sin. As we said before, sin affects everybody, and sometimes our sin has effects into the future. But our sin is not uh, our our sin isn't shouldn't be punished on our children. Nor should we be punished for ancestor decisions. We all should be punished for our own sin. And so when Jesus goes back to Matthew, Matthew 5, 22, when Jesus said, You've heard it was, it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. He's quoting the, the Ten Commandments. He's quoting the Thou shalt not murder passage. And a lot of what the Pharisees were doing, they were giving insufficient interpretation through their, through their traditions. That's what the Catholic Church does. What they do is they say, oh, Scripture's important and traditions are important. And oftentimes, tradition trumps Scripture, which is why we had the Protestant Reformation. The Protestant Reformation said that Scripture interprets Scripture, not our traditions, not our what we want it to say. We need to interpret Scripture in light of Scripture. Anyway, when he said, you've heard it was said, it is rebuke against the scribes and the Pharisees, and they were lowering the commandment to just murder. They thought that you could hate, insult, mock someone as much as they wanted to. And they, as, as long as you stopped short of murder, it was okay. Jesus rebuked this teaching because they took this passage out of context. You see, another commandment is thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, thy neighbor's donkey, thy neighbor's house. That's the tenth commandment, the commandment of covetousness. And Jesus says that this verse needs to be interpreted like of this verse. It's immediate surrounding context. And so we need 
So it's not just the action that is that was what God's condemning. He's condemning the motivation and the thoughts and the heart behind it. And so Jesus, he turns this rabbinic, rabbinic tradition on its head by saying that whoever hates his brother is liable to judgment, and that's the same as murder. So if you hate somebody, if you want them to die, if you think that you, if you want all of life's worst for them, that is a sin. And Jesus is pointing out that is as a direct violation of the thou shalt not murder commandment. Because it also needs to be interpreted in light of the thought behind it. You say, when he says you fool, it's an Aramaic term called reka. And it is the equivalent of saying go to hell. If you wish hell on somebody else, you deserve to go there. It was kind of Jesus' play on words. And Jesus, and also, when he says, whoever insults is verbally liable to the council, the council was the Sanhedrin who made the big, important choices of that time. Jesus, doing the opposite of interpreting how he wants it to or how, how it meant to him, he explains the commandment in its context. And then he shows a correct application of this. Jesus' hearers would have understand that they have not lived up to this law. And playing on the core idea, whenever when he was talking about the, you're liable to the court, you're liable to the council, Jesus said that if you are offer your gift before the altar and go. Yeah, that was a, that's our equivalent to Bible reading and prayer. You know, if you're doing the most religious thing ever, the most religious thing in the whole world, it does not make up for your sin. He puts this idea of a court case. Let's say you're at church, you're worshiping God, and, so, and, and you have defrauded somebody of, of a big, large amount of money. And they can take you to court and drag you to prison. Well, you need to go up to that person and make it right with them. You need to go up to that person and pay back what you owe them. Or else you're going to go to court. The judge is going to righteously say, you're going to jail, and then you'll be thrown in prison until you have served your time. That's exactly what Jesus is playing on here. And the thing is, these people, just like everybody else, haven't just sinned against man. They've sinned against God. And a sin against God is eternity in hell for all time. That is a very scary thought. It's not... Judgment is waiting for those who have sinned against God. Anyone who's ever told a lie, anyone who's ever stolen, anyone who's ever used the Lord's name in vain. God's going to righteously judge them and He's going to throw them in hell. What these people are doing in Seattle and Minnesota and it even went in Chicago and even went down as far as Champaign. This rioting, this looting, this, this burning down of buildings, killing people, beating up people. What they're doing, they're going to be held accountable to God for their sin. They're not going to, God's not going to dismiss their case because they think that they're in the right because their ancestors were oppressed by slavery or they think that they're doing, making it right by burning down these buildings so they can make up for their ancestors enslaving other people. That just doesn't work, ladies and gentlemen. No, what you're doing is heaping up sin upon sin upon sin upon sin upon sin. And it's your own sin. And it's God's going to judge you for that sin. But it doesn't just apply to Antifa or to these rioters and protesters. It doesn't just apply to Democrats. It applies to everybody. If you've ever lied, use the words in vain. How many people say, oh my, and insert God's name in the blank to, for, to use as a curse word? You hear that all the time in TV shows. That is a sin of blasphemy. And it's very, it's very big in God's eyes. He says he won't hold anybody who's used his name. Anyone who's used his name in vain, he will not hold guiltless. That is very, very important, ladies and gentlemen, my brothers and sisters. 
God will not legally dismiss the case of anybody who sins and then tries to make up for it by their own works. We are all looked at as guilty, vile, rotten sinners. The sins of Antipha and God's eyes are equivalent to the sins, to our sins. And here's why, not because of the earthly effects, but because they're sins against him. Let's say I lie to my daughter Lydia over there. I just lie to her. Let's say I say that Santa Claus is real. Let's say that I lie to her about that. She finds out differently. She can't do anything anymore. She can be angry with me. That's about it. Let's say I lie to my wife. That could be a night on the couch for me. Okay, let's take it a step further. Let's say I lie to my boss and I get found out about it. That is going to be a unemployment line for me after that. I would lose my job. Let's say I go a step further and lie to the IRS about my taxes coming up in, Ju in July 15th. There's, is it June or July? I think it's July. Yeah, July 15th. And they find out about it. That's a big hefty fine in prison time for me. Or let's say I lie to the government. Well, that's treason and that's a capital punishment. So we lie to people who is made in God's image, therefore relying to God. And God has a right to throw us in hell for all eternity. You see how the, how, how the crime, same crime, progresses? And the punishment is worse for every single person we've done it towards? Well, look at God, who's, who's, the, who's infinite, pure. He is the most innocent being in the whole, outside of the whole universe. Inside, outside. God's omnipresent. So that's how big God is. That's how big His, His infinity is. And we've lied to God. Shouldn't we be punished infinitely? Well, our problem is that when we're punished infinitely, it means that we're going to be punished in hell for all eternity for our sin. If you go to the next verse, next little, next little part in Matthew, Matthew 5, talks about lust. You've heard it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who uh, looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members and your whole body be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body to go into hell. Anger People say, you know, I think I'm a good person. I haven't murdered anybody. I haven't taken anybody's life. But you're insulting somebody, and you're saying you, you, you should go to hell. God uses that the same thing. I haven't committed adultery. I haven't done anything wrong. Well, God, no, because of covetousness, uh, you actually committed adultery already in your heart. So the sins of Antifa, they burn down buildings and they, 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 uh, they, 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 kill, they beat up people, they shoot and kill police officers. They're horrible people, they should be taken out, put in jail. No, Trump should send in the military and wipe them out. Well, your sin of anger and hatred towards them is the same as their murder and their burning down buildings. We like to make sins, you know, a little bit less in our eyes. Maybe, and there's no such thing as white privilege, folks. You and I are going to be judged for our own sin. No such thing as black privilege. They're going to be judged for their own sin. There's no such thing as systemic racism. A, a society cannot sin. But individuals in that society can sin. And they can sin. And that sin abounds. And it makes life really hard on everybody. And it also dishonors God. The sin that we you know, think that is okay, or this white sin, amounts to big, huge, insurmountable problems. 
And I keep talking about the problem. And I keep talking about this hatred and this anger and this murder that we're all accountable for. I just say it, say it, we're not good people. And we're not good people at heart. Romans 3, 10. No one is righteous. No, not one. You know, Romans 3, 23. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of, glory of God. But are justified by His grace's gift. Jesus shows us how to use the Bible. You know, in its intended purposes. To break us down and make our hearts Broken so that he, so that if we repent and put our faith and trust in Jesus, we'll be made right with God. You see, you and I can't do anything to make ourselves better. We can't. If you if you are suicidal and you think that taking your life will, will set you right with God like Jesus, like Judas did, you know, Peter said that Judas ended up in hell. Taking your life doesn't make things right with anybody. No, Jesus gave up his life so that anybody who repents and put their faith and trust in him will have eternal life. You can't pay the last penny. You can't pay the first penny on your sin debt towards God because there is no righteousness in us. There is no goodness in us. All good things come from God, as James says. But you can be made right with God. And not of your own works, but because of the works of Jesus, that He lived a perfect life. He, 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 was, he healed people. He did miraculous signs. He did good works, good works that you and I couldn't even fathom of. And He not once, ever once, ever sinned. Because He became sin who knew no sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God. He knew no sin. But He was looked at by God as a sinner because He bore our sin on the cross. So anyone who looks upon Him can, be, can have their sins washed away because God, seeing His Son, crushed Him. He, just, he crushed it. That's what Isaiah 53 says. He crushed Him. It pleased the Lord to crush Him so you and I could be made right with Him. And we need to repent of our sin. Repenting of your sin alone won't save you, but you, repenting and trusting in Jesus will save you. It doesn't mean, repentance doesn't mean going around with shackles on, imitating the slavery of black people back in the 16, 17, and 1800s. It doesn't mean that. Repentance is what Jesus said. Blessed are the poor in spirit, recognizing your spiritual poverty. Blessed are those who mourn, mourning over your sin like the loved one that was lost. Being humble, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And then hungry and thirsting for righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Pleading for mercy and seeking the mercy of others. Seeking to be merciful to others, because it says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Then asking a pure heart for God. Because blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. Then wanting to be at peace with God and make peace with all people. That's what repentance, part of repentance is. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And they be willing to be persecuted for righteousness' sake and doing the right thing. Doing the right thing and not going, going back. Blessed are those persecuted for righteous sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's what real repentance is. And God grants that to us. He grants us repentance. And so if you are broken over your sin, over the sins that you've done to men and to God, and you're broken, you say, I'm sorry, Lord. Please forgive me of my sin. Please change me to the new creature, to be a new man, be a new woman, made in Christ Jesus. I surrender to Jesus. Please save me, God. Please save me from all my sin. 
Please save me from hell. I'm, 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 I deserve to go to hell. Please save me and have me be right with Jesus. And if that's your heart's desire, if that's your heart's longing to be right with Jesus, just call out to God and He'll, He's most so merciful. He'll save you from all your sin, past, present, future sin. Whether you're Antifa, whether you're, whether you're black or you're white or you're Mexican, you're Irish, you're Russian, you're Asian, Chinese, whatever. God has salvation for you in Jesus Christ if you repent and trust in Jesus. Because when He died on the cross, He paid all. He paid your fine on the cross, and God can legally dismiss your case. You can be made right with God, be adopted into His kingdom, be, be a son of God. You are reigning with Christ forever. And when Jesus comes back, folks, we'll get to rise in the air and be with Christ. And, we'll be come to, and we will come and God, Jesus will judge the world over their sin and wipe out all sin. And then we will get to reign with Christ forever and ever in the new heavens and the new earth. Where there's no more tears, no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more sin. You know, some people think that the golden streets are what appeals people to heaven, or the or the beautiful jewels, or the temple, or the tree of life, or being with our loved ones that are lost. I'm ready for sin to be gone, aren't you? And that'll happen. Christ comes back. And will be raised from the dead and live for him within forever and ever. If we repent and trust in Jesus. So until then, if you repented and trusted in Jesus, we need to be going out and doing the works that Jesus has prepared for us beforehand. And that is to proclaim the gospel. To proclaim that Jesus is Lord and that there's salvation in no other name than in Jesus Christ. And if you repent and trust in Jesus, you'll be saved. Then we should go out proclaiming that and baptizing people in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And teaching them to observe all that He commanded us. That is our goal. It's not to hate wicked people. We hate the sin. We hate... The one behind it, Satan. We hate the print, the spiritual forces that are that are behind all this. But we go and we proclaim the gospel of forgiveness and grace in Jesus Christ. We proclaim it to everyone, even the people we think are worst. Who we right now? It's Antifa and jihadists, and it's it's they're not that they're worse. It's that they're less controlled of their sin. They need the gospel. They need Jesus. They need His salvation and forgiveness of sins. That's why I do all I can. Wherever I go, I try to share the gospel. I, I don't wait fit, 15 minutes. I do everything I can to try to segue into the gospel. Every conversation. And I write literature to hand out to people to be saved. That's what those gospel tracts were I gave you before the service. They're gospel tracts. They're designed to show people how to interpret the Scripture, and then it interprets John 3.16, and then it shows them how to be saved. And it points them to reading the Bible and going to church and to trust. Most, most important thing, it has points them to repenting and trusting Jesus. So I, I, I have more in the back if you want to hand those out. But more importantly, just go out wherever you can and share the Gospel because Jesus is coming soon and there will be a time when they can't repent. We don't want that. We want Jesus to come back, but we want to try to save as many people as we can. Let's bow for the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Jesus and for what he's done for us. Lord, we're sorry for our own sin, and we repent of our own sin, and we trust in Jesus alone to be saved. Lord, as we go out today, help us to, 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 to uh, worship you and everything we say and do, whether it's singing, whether it's working, whether it's sharing the gospel, whether it's reading our, your word, whether it's praying to you, help us to go out with whole hearts, trusting in Jesus, and, li and living in Him, and loving Him, and proclaiming your gospel. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for us being able to gather here today. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for the gospel. Lord, as we go out today, help us to live lives that are new and refreshed by your word and by your son. Help us to go out and proclaim the gospel and to trust in Jesus as Savior. As in Jesus' holy, precious name we pray. Amen. Oh. Uh -huh.